All right. All right. Good morning, everybody. I, if I hear you speaking, I am going to put you on mute. Hold on one second. We're just waiting for everybody to log in and then we'll get started. I see a couple folks still dialing in. So let me just wait for TIC. And then we'll go ahead and get started. I sure am. All right. I'll wait one more minute. All right, there we go. All right, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you were able to join us. We have been having many, many discussions with Dr. Jim O'Day, who is a psycho psychologist and also one of the leaders in our behavioral health network. So we're really pleased to bring to you Dr. O'Day's take on some of what we're doing wrong when we talk to folks and what we can do right when it comes to talking to people you disagree with when it comes to vaccines, vaccine hesitation, even along the lines when it comes to masking. So he has some really important insight and science in a very different way that the vaccine is backed by science. So without further ado, I introduce you to Dr. James O'Day. Dr. O'Day, take it away. Uh, Rebecca, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So good morning, everyone. My name is Jim O'Day. As Rebecca said, I'm a psychologist by training. I also have a business degree and I've worked at Hartford Healthcare for 32 years. So I've been around for a while, uh, practiced clinically here in the state of Connecticut. And for the most part, actually have been doing for the last two decades, a lot of uh, healthcare administration. This unique sec set of circumstances actually allows me the opportunity to play the psychologist card. And so there is real science around understanding different people's realities and how they're dealing with this very complex issue. And so we have been talking an awful lot. I'm having individual conversations with staff members and leaders about how to approach this question of vaccine hesitancy. And it's not just in healthcare. As we've seen across the country, colleges, universities, large employers across the board are focusing on vaccine and its uh, vaccine hesitancy as a, as, a, in, as a really important topic in today's world. So I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you about some of the perspectives that I bring to this based on the experiences that I've had talking to scores and scores of people who heretofore have, have chosen to not be vaccinated. And, and Rebecca, can I give another brief introduction there? Sure, sure. So, so what I'd like to highlight for the, for the members here, and again, thanks for being here. I guess what I would say is this, a anybody who's wanted to get a vaccine up to this point has gotten a vaccine. It's not hard to get a vaccine in the state of Connecticut right now, and which as I think is terrific. And I think the state of Connecticut has been a leader and how to address the pandemic. Uh, we're very proud of the role that we've played at Hartford Healthcare, but I think across the state, the consortium of leaders have come together to say, let's be forward leaning in trying to come to the end of this pandemic. And I think we've been very successful, but there's also no doubt that there's a large group of people who at this point in time, see this in a very different way. And, and what I wanna talk about today is an approach that I think is really important around how we talk with people who have a diversity of opinions about the vaccine and whether they should choose to be vaccinated or not. And I think for the most part, this gets at this issue of really respecting other people's reality, about really being genuinely curious about what their point of view is and really engaging deeply in listening. And what I describe as active listening behavior asking follow-up questions, wanting to go deeper into why a person might be experiencing this in a way that could be really different than the way that you experience it. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about that in a little bit more detail. I'm happy to take questions and uh, uh, invite your comments. 
And you can raise your hands if you have questions on the onset or uh, the other part, um, Dr. O'Day, is to really delve into what you see people doing. I, I think when you divvy up, what are people doing right and what are folks doing wrong? Does anyone have any questions before he delves into that? You can raise your hand or you can write it in our chat box as we do. So while you're either typing or considering your question, I will jump right into that. So thank you, Rebecca. There are some do's and don'ts actually. And I think there are some tools and tips. And this is really based in cognitive science, really understanding how people process information. And as I said at the introduction, anybody who's wanted to get a vaccine, you know, the state of Connecticut distributes across a bell curve. There were a bunch of early adopters that couldn't wait to be vaccinated. There were a bunch of people in the big part of the bell curve that have gotten themselves vaccinated and we've moved forward. There's another part of the bell curve where people right now are not either interested in doing that or putting it off or considering what's the right way to approach that. And I guess what I'm gonna say about that is I've seen people turn this into a debate and, they, and I've heard them try to argue a position. Let me make something really, really clear. You can't change someone else's mind. It's hard enough to change our own mind about an issue that you feel strongly about. So these efforts at changing somebody else's mind is unproductive. In fact, in my experience, it's counterproductive. What is, however, very constructive is to really genuinely try to get inside what somebody else is thinking. And the way we do that is to put our own perspective aside, put it off in a corner somewhere, and ask really questions, probing, curious questions about their, and I'm gonna give an example um, that I think has been very instructive to me. I've had a lot of conversations with people and I'm gonna cite uh, one where people expressed a very strong opinion about, you know, Jim, I'll tell you why I haven't been vaccinated yet. I don't trust the healthcare system. I don't, I don't trust it. And, 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 you know, I asked, well, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And this was a black American. And the woman said to me, I don't, I don't trust your science. I just don't trust the healthcare system. There's a really important word there. What she said is, I don't trust your science. So I asked her, slow down for a minute. What did you mean by your science? And she said, well, let's be clear about a couple things. The vast amount of research, even not about the vaccine, any medical research is based on populations, mostly of white people. All the research on diabetes and hypertension and the efficacy of this medicine versus that medicine is almost always based in research studies on white people. And she said, you know, here we have diseases like diabetes and hypertension that disproportionately affect African-American communities. But most of the science that you talk about is based on populations of Caucasians. So it leaves me to be a little bit skeptical. Now I could have been defensive there and started to justify or explain it. And I said instead, can you tell me more? Like, tell me more about that. And she looked at me and she said, do you really wanna hear more? And I said, yeah, I do. And some of you um, probably know where she went. She went to Tuskegee. And she went to the research study that was initiated in the 1930s, where we, and here's her words, not my words, here's her words. Jim, during the Tuskegee syphilis study, we treated people who look like me like lab rats. We were guinea pigs. And I asked her to tell me more about that. And we went into quite a bit of detail. And I can tell you, if you're not familiar with the tragedies associated with that research study, please study it a little bit, spend 20 minutes on Wikipedia. And if you do, you will be mortified by things that we did in this country under the lens of research in healthcare. So if you're a black American, there's an experience that is well-documented about ways that we've not been respectful. And in fact, have caused great harm 
So I think entering into a conversation with people and really trying to understand what leads them to feel and think the way they're feeling can be very, very constructive, not necessarily trying to convince someone to be vaccinated, but to simply demonstrate that you actually care about their point of view and you're not just waiting for them to stop talking so that you can articulate your point of view. So that's really an approach that I think at this stage of the game is really important is that we need to spend time with a lot more listening. So with that long story, let me pause again if there are any questions or follow-ups on that. Any questions for folks? You can type it in, you can raise your hand. I, I, could I ask a question, Rebecca? Absolutely, go ahead, Alex. Um, I figure, you know, so the Census Bureau put out some data state by state about um, reasons for vaccine hesitancy. So I thought I'd ask about how you would respond to some of the biggest ones. So in Connecticut, the biggest reason people give for not wanting a vaccine is they're concerned about possible side effects. So if somebody says they're concerned about possible side effects, what, what is your answer? A great question, uh, Mr. Potterman. Thank you. Well, so this is exactly on point. I actually wouldn't answer the question. I would ask more questions, right? And so we have a whole cast of professionals. I'm so proud of working together with our infectious disease people and all the people who really understand that hard science. And you've had many interviews with those folks, Keith Grant, Dr. Ulysses Wu, uh, so many strong partners who can really speak uh, very clearly around the science, that science of the side effects. What I would say in a situation like that is I would say, tell me more about the side effects you're concerned about. Because there's a lot of things that it could be. It might be a woman who's concerned about the literature that says something about fertility. It might be a person who's concerned about it exacerbating another condition they may have. So I really think that's a perfect place to not start spouting off about here's a percentage of people who have side effects and here's a percentage of people who don't. The person said something, that individual said something about side effects. I would wanna be curious about what's on their mind and why that in that circumstance leads them to be hesitant. And there's probably a hundred different stories for a hundred different people. Dr. Day, is there evidence that when you listen like you're suggesting and not quick to retort with an actual answer that is a that with the goal to convince, which is really different and why we're having this conversation, that there's a moment to pause that people may come around eventually because they are heard. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would say differently about that is that it's not that they come around to it, but they themselves become curious about a different point of view. So when people are genuinely listened to, and really feel heard, they actually do begin to be a bit more open to maybe there's other alternative perspectives. You stop drinking, you need to eat your vegetables. Whatever it may be, human behavior is behavior but it's behavior which is articulated as a result of thoughts and feelings that people have. And so what happens is when people don't understand and believe that they actually have a problem, and we, and we do this all the time in my business, when we prescribe an action-oriented step, like you should go do the following thing, to a person who is right now not even aware that there's a problem, we end up calling them names. We call them resistant. We call them non-compliant. And it's really because a healthcare professional has misjudged where the person is in their reality. And so it's only at a point where somebody is going to say, you know, I might be interested in thinking about this differently, where it makes sense to engage in a conversation of what are the pros and cons of different choices, whatever the topic might be. Right now we're talking about vaccination, but the same perspective applies to any of these kind of habits or choices that people are contemplating doing differently in their life. And it really does come down to this, what I believe to be radical acceptance of their reality and, and really wanting to learn more about how people are thinking and feeling about something. And, and that may have the benefit of then somebody else saying, 
wow, you've really cared enough to understand about me. Maybe I'm a little bit open to some of the stuff that's on your mind. Dr. O'Day, I have a couple of questions for you. Yes, uh, hi, it's, it's Matt Karen at Fox 61. Thanks for taking these questions. Um, we've been hearing from a couple of younger people who are of age to get a COVID vaccine, um, but they're not old enough to give their own consent. So, and their, their parents don't want them to get vaccinated. Um, have you been hearing from any of these younger folks and, and how would you counsel them if they believe that the vaccine is the right choice for them, but they're not of age to get it themselves? Wow, that's a fascinating dynamic. Um, I've not heard that a lot, Matt. I'm sure it's the case. I have a feeling, you know, these become very, very individual family related decisions. And how a family navigates a question like this is probably related how they navigate a lot of things. I would hope <coughs> this would be, I guess, counsel for both. It would be counsel for the young person, which is admire your gumption and admire your, you know, conviction. But it also, I hope, for parents would lead them to a place of curiosity. Um, you know, I'm going to come back to this theme again. If you've got a young person who's talking to their parents about making important life choices, first off, let's just celebrate that, that, that we can't take that for granted. And then I think it's, you know, this is a place where more is more. You know that expression, sometimes less is more. That's always, that can be true. There's also times where more is more. And more dialogue, more conversation, more curiosity is what I hope that family would engage in. Okay, and uh, my second question for you is, you know, as you've been talking to people who are vaccine hesitant, um, have you been have you been realizing that their concerns uh, are are of a personal nature? Do they do they understand that their health personal health decision how that may impact, you know, the community on a larger on a larger scale? And is that something that you're trying to emphasize? Because it's really not just a personal decision. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, there is that expression, right? Your personal rights and liberties extend to the edge of the water where they begin to impact on my personal rights and my liberties. And I understand that. I will say that I don't find that that's a productive road to go down. Uh, I think most people who are in this place right now, it is very individual. Uh, I'll give another example, if I may. I was actually talking to somebody this week who said, you know what, I work for an organization, it doesn't happen to be mine. I work for an organization that has said it's a requirement for me to continue to work here uh, to be vaccinated. And actually what the person said to me is, I was actually probably inclined to get vaccinated, but the fact that I'm being forced to do it by my employer makes me feel really grumpy. And, and there's a part of me that just wants to resist because it reminds me, and, and he used the word bully. He feels like I'm being bullied. And I asked him about that. And I said, well, tell me a little bit about that bullying thing. He immediately told me, immediately told me a story that was heartbreaking, that when he was 11 years old, he was locked in a gym locker. So here we are having a conversation about vaccine. And in less than a minute and a half, he's talking about feeling bullied in his life and the impact that had on him. So at that point, there's an emotional part of this, which is very personal. And so having a conversation with that person about, well, you know, if you don't do this, it has an impact on other people around you. There's this rich vein, frankly, of pain that we ended up talking about for a little while. And it wasn't because I was trying to hope that he would get vaccinated. It was just to be humanistic. Hi, this is Erica Moser with The Day Newspaper. I was at a vaccine clinic earlier this week and talking to a few people who were there getting their first shot. And one thing that had come up a few times with some people was just how scared they were of, of needles. And, and one of those people was someone who, you know, working at a nursing home and did have to get vaccinated now, loved her job. And she came with some family who were there to support her. Another family member said too, you know, they were scared of needles. So how do you kind of address that uh, specific type of hesitancy? Just the story you told. Uh, I love that this is a person who, despite their fears, enlisted the allies in their life, enlisted the supports. We have a story unique to this organization 
where one of our leaders has done everything and more. And so was first to get the shot, told all about his side effect experience, both the sore arm. And for him, he ended up having a voracious appetite the next day, told people those stories. He's met with every single individual and tried to understand their reality. And he did, Erica, exactly what you said for some of his staff members. He said, listen, I'll walk with you. I'll hold your hand. I'll sit next to you when it's happening. I'll sing a song. I'll do whatever you want to do because it's what they want to do to, to deal with that fear. He said, I, I, he didn't do it because he wanted them to get vaccinated. He did it because he wanted to support them in their decision to be vaccinated. And one more question. I know we're, we're not talking about things here really from the frame of convincing, but from, from the frame of listening. But when you look at, you know, the percentage of the population that remains unvaccinated, do you have a sense of kind of what share of that is people who, you know, maybe would change their mind or consider getting vaccinated if they really felt heard and listening to versus kind of what people just nothing, there is no way they will ever get vaccinated? Um, I, 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 it's hard for me to estimate the percentage. You know, it's interesting. It also raises this other question is it's almost irrelevant because I think at this stage of the game, especially people uh, who do have strenuous views about this topic, whether they're based in race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, political views, People just want to be heard and, and not with an aim towards convincing them to get to a different place, but simply to respect each other's position. You know, I do think that that's a, a larger issue actually in our society these days, which is people who have strenuous positions on different topics do have a tendency to listen less and talk more. And they'll articulate their point of view. And when they hear somebody talking about the divergent opinion, you know, they, they often wait and simply wait until the next person stops talking and then they reiterate their position. It's actually rare to see people say, can you tell me more about that? I'd like to better understand that view. I want to be curious about what your point of view is. I think that goes a long way towards people working through complex topics. So I have a quick question. So um, Dr. O'Day, are you um, like against vaccine mandates in, in most or all cases, or do you think there is a there's room for a mandate in some circumstances? Uh, I think this pandemic has been one of the most, I've been working in healthcare for over 35 years. I'm proud of that. I've never seen something devastate um, our country and the world like this pandemic. Um, so I think, think for us to come to the other side of the pandemic, we need to take steps that will protect the safety of our communities. So do I think there's a place? Yes, there's absolutely a place for this. And, and I think um, we also then at the same time respect people's individual choices around it. But I by no means am opposed to them. It would be far preferable if people would move in a place where they, they can do this in a, in, a, in a way without those mandates. Um, but we're at a place right now in this country where we are still seeing now a dramatic surge in largely driven by the, the Delta variant of this, this virus. And, um, you know, we thought we were coming to the end of this terrible, terrible tragedy, and now we're seeing it rise again. And so we have, if we expect different results, we have to do something different. And so, yes, I think there's a place for it. It is 1024. Does anyone have any more questions? I don't see anything in the chat. And if we, last chance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I hope this is valuable. Thank you for joining. It was really interesting when I, I heard Dr. O'Day talk about this a couple days ago, and I thought this is something that could be valuable for you, for your readers, for your viewers, for your listeners to learn a little bit more about about different tactics. And I love, Dr. Arde, what you just said. If we want different results, we clearly have to do things differently. And as the world is moving to mandates, how do we get folks there on their own? And I think that that's why this conversation was so valuable. So please, please reach out if you have any questions. And thank you so much for taking part in this media briefing. Thanks so much. Have a great day.
Thank you. Thank you.